Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mike Alexander, and I'm the director of the Center for Livable Communities at the Atlanta Regional Commission. Welcome to today's ARC webinar program entitled People, Parks, Paths, and the Pandemic. And this great title is brought to you by George Dusenberry, one of our panelists today. And in the pre-planning for this webinar, we were trying to work on the name, and George gets the uh, honor of coming up with the best name. And I think uh, I think uh, it really speaks to why we're here today. And um, I can't say enough how glad I am that everybody's decided to join us today. Um, as always, before we get started, I wanna acknowledge that we're using the GoToWebinar platform. And of mm -hmm. course, uh, you'll see uh, on the next slide, if it lets me go to the next slide, that the, uh, that the GoToWebinar platform allows you to really have two ways of, of using its, uh, its software capabilities now in a browser or in the desktop version. Um, just be aware to look for the GoToWebinar icons if you actually lose the screen or something happens. Um, critically today, uh, we really want this to be a conversation. Uh, so as you're listening to the presentations that are going to follow, Please send us questions um, along the way. When we finish the presentations, we're going to have a great conversation to talk about uh, the this uh, the presentations that you've seen today, really focusing on on this idea of people and parts. Um, we, as always, we will record this webinar. We will post it on the ARC webinar page as well. So if you have to drop off, you can always um, come back to the ARC website and find this web webinar for your viewing pleasure. Uh, first, let me say that um, we have spent a lot of time talking about what this uh, webinar would really mean, and I can't underscore enough what the COVID pandemic has meant for parks. And when we started fleshing this idea out, you'll see the panelists represent, I think, really um, the best uh, the best minds thinking about what the pandemic has meant for parks. We've got examples that will be statewide at times down to specific trails. All, um, all will be talking about this within the lens of uh, what the pandemic means for people. And of course, first up will be Michael Hallecky. He's the executive director of Park Pride. Following Michael will be George Dusenberry. George is a state director of Georgia and Alabama for the Trust for Public Land. Uh, he's also a huge Atlanta United fan, and he's not very happy today about that. <laughs> then we'll have uh, Ravonda Cosby, who's the executive director of the Arabia Mountain Heritage Area Alliance. Uh, she's going to bring a lot of energy to this webinar today. It's been a lot of fun talking with her about her work. And then finally, we've got Betsy Eggers, the founder of the Peachtree Creek Greenway uh, Incorporated. And Betsy, uh, one of the things I love most about her is that she's been doing this purely on a volunteer basis and everything she's going to talk about has been done by volunteers. And I think her story, the story of the Peachtree Creek Greenway, uh, really exemplifies the best of what we love about people committed to making Metro Atlanta as great as it can be. And so with that, mm -hmm. we're going to start to switch the screens. I'm going to turn it over uh, to Michael Hallecky with Jared Lombard, our, our web uh, guru, helping him to walk through his presentation. So again, thank you so much for being with us today. It's going to be fun. Excellent. Well, it's great to be with everyone here today. Can everyone hear me okay? I feel like I need that or I have my moment yes. of mute. So um, as uh, Mike shared, our, our topic today is people, parks, paths, and the pandemic. And in my time today, I'd like to share a little bit about who I am and a little bit about Park Pride. I'd like to share my own uh, COVID experience, if you will, in ways that my perspective has changed from my experiences in the outdoors this year. Um, next, I'd like to give you some thoughts on how you might um, take this as an initiative to get out there and to have a deeper experience with all the great um, uh, parks and paths all throughout our region um, and to make the most of this opportunity. And from there, I have some opening thoughts that I think will help to frame this conversation. And there are really two areas I'd like to spend some time with. First, um, what's changed in the world of parks and trails in 2020? 
Um, and I think that uh, certainly COVID is a big part of that, that has had people in their homes and uh, looking at getting outdoors in a different way. Um, but I also think there are two other um, elephants in the room that I'd like to kind of raise up here. One of which is the heightened awareness of racial injustice and um, really marked by the death of, and the killing of George Floyd and the conversations that are being had um, around the dinner table and in various different places on systemic racism um, and equity issues. And then the third is really looking at the economic fallout uh, from COVID-19 and the economic uncertainty that we face here today. Um, and that will really lead us into a conversation over the new case for parks, which is the way that I've come to think about how uh, the, the case for parks today is different than before COVID. And in some ways it draws upon the current context that we're in here today. Uh, next slide, Jared. So let's uh, start off with a little bit about uh, who I am. Um, you'll see here that um, oftentimes in ARC circles, I'm referred to as the parks guy. Um, I own uh, that, that, uh, that moniker with pride. Um, I am the executive director of Park Pride. It's a role that I've played since 2013. Uh, before that, I held roles at South Face, the Clean Air Campaign, and the Georgia Conservancy. Um, I also have numerous uh, connections to the Atlanta Regional Commission. Right now, I'm involved in an effort um, involving folks that have gone through uh, Link coming back from Pittsburgh um, that have uh, looked at uh, a phrase we heard there that if it's not for all, it's not for us. And that group, the, re the Racial Equity Leadership Program, is something that I'm very excited about. Um, I am a, a regular attendee on LINK. I did RLI back in uh, uh, 2009. Um, so I like to think of myself as someone who um, thinks both locally and regionally um, in the work that I do at Park Pride. Something that you'll learn about me if it isn't already apparent is that I'm a social person. I connect with folks in different ways. I would encourage you to connect with me on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. Uh, Facebook is the best way to connect with all the different great places in terms of nature, parks, and trails that I'm going to, and to use that as a chance to get out there yourself. Next slide. A little bit about Park Pride. Uh, first off, uh, Park Pride is a 30-year-old locally-based nonprofit. We have a staff of 14. Uh, total operating budget is $1.3 million. And in addition to that, we bring $1.3 million of philanthropic resources for community-led park improvements uh, that happen within the service areas that we work. Um, our mission is to engage communities to activate the power of parks. The two key words there are community and parks. So it really is about the changes that happen within a community, as well as the physical changes to parks to make them more reflective of the community's needs. Our vision is Park Pride envisions in Atlanta and strengthened by and united through parks, trails, and green spaces that meet the needs and reflect the unique character of communities. So the main point here is to understand that relationship, that it isn't just about the spaces, it's about the people. And that's the role that Park Pride has played for the past three decades. Uh, we began in the city of Atlanta and uh, continue to be, when we're in an office, co-located with the Parks Department in the city of Atlanta. We also have been working in DeKalb County now for 10 years, so a big milestone year for us in DeKalb. And more recently, we've expanded into Brookhaven and Tucker um, as new cities have been formed in those areas, and we had active relationships with uh, the friends of the park groups in those different areas and have continued those relationships in Brookhaven and Tucker. Um, next slide, please. So our model is really focused on engaging community uh, to activate the power of parks and getting folks involved on a very hands-on way. We believe, much like the Trust for Public Land, that everyone deserves a quality park within walking distance. And we work with communities to be part of the change they wish to see in the world, but to work um, in partnership with our government partners to improve our parks. Um, um, the whole focus is really building trust and it's building trust with Park Pride working with communities, uh, building trust between communities and government, a place that sometimes getting them harmonized together is 90% uh, of the problem. So once we can get folks kind of moving in the same direction, great things happen. Next slide. Um, um, if you want to go to Park Pride's website, you can check out all the different uh, programs we have. Uh, though we work in these different jurisdictions, Park Pride is a hyper-local organization. So we work with um, over 150 Friends of the Park groups in all the different service areas I've mentioned. We help groups raise restricted dollars for their parks. 
uh, grants and other types of things. So this uh, model has developed organically over time, meeting the needs of communities. Uh, recently, we've made some changes also to our grant program, waiving the matching requirement uh, for some of our larger grants in low income areas, uh, recognizing some of the limitations in those different areas. So it's very uh, adaptive and being a locally based organization, we have that flexibility. Next slide. So um, that was kind of the end of my Park Pride uh, portion of the conversation. I wanted to share just my COVID experience. You'll notice the COVID beard, a little different than my picture in the photos, uh, but it isn't just skin deep. I actually have found that my experience in parks has been very different in COVID. Uh, number one, I've been working, uh, working from home and have found that the idea of end of the day walks with my family um, or with my dogs or by myself, that these re regular experiences of getting out in nature have become commonplace. Um, the idea of uh, prioritizing nature close to where I live has become more of an important thing. So I think there are some ways that there's been this inversion of the park's hierarchy, where the park that everyone goes to isn't always the park you want to go to. You want to go to the places that are walkable, that are close by. Um, I've also find there's a, um, a concept of a nature pyramid that looks at much like the food groups and things along those lines. There's your daily park experiences. Then there's the places you might go weekly and then uh, maybe once a month. And so I look at uh, great resources like the Chattahoochee National Recreation Area um, and other different parks that people go to. So I have found that uh, part of my experience has been to find those hidden gems. You'll see an image here with a camera. So I kind of stepped up my game from taking photos on with my iPhone and posting them on Facebook to actually getting more into photography and deepening my experience there. Um, it has been a time to get personal time in nature. Let's go on to the next slide. Uh, from there, I found that I have um, gotten involved um, in other um, kind of deeper experiences in uh, nature, one of which has been birds and understanding all the birds that are all around us. And this is something my daughter and I have uh, definitely enjoyed, uh, both in terms of backyard habitat, the nature parks in our areas, and then some of the different nature parks to go to. Uh, my 16-year-old son is there um, uh, joining me at different mountain biking um, escapades. So um, again, looking at different types of activities that has become another way that we're getting outdoors. And then last of all, I'll just mention the family connections that uh, going to parks as a nature side of things has been part of it. But part of it has also been getting that time out with my family in nature. And this is not something that is unique to me. It's something that I hear from folks on a much larger uh, level and a more meaningful level than what people were having before COVID. Let's move on to the next slide. This is something that, um, um, I share my personal experience really to try to encourage you to go out there and see all the great places. We live in an amazing region with some amazing parks and trails. Uh, there's a book that I'm a big fan of by Jonah McDonald called Hiking Atlanta's Hidden Forests. Um, if you're looking for something that is a little bit further out into the region, there's also a book called um, um, 60 Hikes Within 60 Miles that looks at different uh, slightly longer areas to go within uh, the, the city of Atlanta and the larger region. And then if you want to move off of the analog approach of looking at books, um, atlantatrails.com is a great place to go to to look at fall hikes and things along those lines. Uh, the main point is if you start actually going out there to discover what's there, you will be amazed um, and I would encourage you to do so. So uh, let's move on to the next slide. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what's changed. So park use is, is up. There's um, uh, we do have information from people carrying around their cell phones and Google tracking this kind of information that park use statewide, I think is up 60% is what I had seen uh, most recently. Meanwhile, retail and work is way down and grocery trips are about the same, but happening at different times and in different ways. Uh, but the big thing is that people are going to parks in much greater numbers and those that were already going to parks are going there more frequently. Um, there was recently a statistically valid survey done within the city of Atlanta that also found that the perception of value, 66% say that the value of parks has increased since, since COVID. So not only are people getting out in parks, they're actually finding that they're more important in their lives. And I really see this as something that's changing um, kind of the park people as a select few as something that is the many. And some of our different um, uh, polling efforts will find that there are um, very few people that haven't been out to a park this year. 
and many people have made it a very much more regular uh, part of their experience. Uh, two quotes that I um, I include here, um, one of which um, uh, nobody goes here anymore. It's too crowded. That's Yogi Berra. Uh, but I think it's something that came up during some of the calamity of the East Side Trail and the skate park, uh, where in some cases the the concern was that too many people were going to some of our signature parks. And really this idea that we should be spreading out our usage to go to places in non-peak times and also discovering other amenities. Um, and then this is a quote that I just, um, I find that I hear regularly that there's this amazing park near where I live. I never knew it was there prior to the pandemic. So people are actually finding these hidden gems that they found that they never knew were there and experiencing them. And that really brings me to the fact that people are using parks differently than the way that they were and they're playing a role serving different functions. So uh, certainly the trails are playing a role in terms of exercise. Um, I mentioned with my family, part of it is the bonding experience of going to a park. The other is the steam valve of give, getting a chance with these kids that have been cooped up all day looking at a screen to go run around somewhere. Um, so parks are playing a different role and in some ways, there's places that people were going indoors that now parks are the place that people are going instead. So parks are playing a different role. They're serving different functions. And in some ways, they're serving roles that in, in prior times were being met by other, uh, other things. So let's go on to our next slide. Um, and this is my last slide, the new case for parks. And um, the first point is that what is old is new and uh, parks serve a public health function. When you look at the early days of the urban parks movement in the United States and looking at Frederick Law Homestead and Central Park, um, a lot of the efforts to create wide open spaces in our dense cities uh, was in response to public health issues. Um, it was very heavily on people's minds, the impact of the Spanish flu that led to this idea that places that we have concentrations of people need open space. And I find that in some ways we're coming back to that idea and even the psychological impact of being able to go to a place, I live near Grant Park and being able to see that open landscape and not being in that place where you're walking on sidewalks and crossing the streets and keeping your distance. Having open spaces have a psychological benefit as well as um, the opportunity for places for exercise. Nice to have amenities, or, or that they're uh, not nice to have amenities. I think oftentimes people think of parks as the nice to have areas. Sometimes I find the regional conversation doesn't always include parks because that's a local issue. And really, when you think about this situation right now, there is a correlation between areas that have higher instances of COVID and places that don't have the same amenities in terms of parks. Um, we really need to. Um, think about parks as the critical infrastructure that we need um, in our cities um, as uh, some of the core things that we need um, as we have concentrations of people. Par uh, parks also play a role in terms of dealing with stormwater issues and other types of benefits. Uh, but the main point is that they're not nice to have, they're critical infrastructure. Um, the, the next one is that they're not for the select few. Um, and again, looking at things in terms of uh, the point that I just made, I think that there's an increasing understanding that everyone should have access to a park, people should have access to nature. And again, there have been studies that have been done that um, look at, and I, I always bring up the example of Willie B sitting, um, um, uh, the uh, gorilla that for those that remember used to sit in front of his TV and watch TV. And when we moved to creating an environment for um, the silverback gorillas at the zoo, it wasn't because it was a better experience for the visitors alone. It was also because of the fact that this was the habitat requirements that added to the health and wellness of those animals and actually put years on their lives. We have a very similar situation in terms of people's innate need for access to nature and parks and trails serve that need. Um, so again, I think the idea that everyone deserves access to nature, deserves access to parks, um, and then uh, last of all, this is my closing. Um, I'd like for you to think today, and I'd really like to challenge you to think about our region and how parks, trails, and nature fits within our regional brand. Uh, that we have some great uh, trail amenities. The Beltline I think of as the Kevin, the, the Kevin Bacon of trails. Every other trail is connected to uh, the Beltline in some way. And those great those trail amenities are great in and of themselves, but it's really the regional trail network that makes Atlanta great and our potential to build out that trail network and what it means to live in the region 
uh, that's the big idea. Uh, there are pockets of nature where we're able to protect biodiversity, but if we really want to protect biodiversity, we need to have a network of nature and think about nature throughout our entire region. And then last of all, I hear people talk about Atlanta as the city in the forest. And if you look at the region as a whole, it's the region in the forest that we have. Um, and really looking at the rich um, um, tree canopy that we have throughout our region, that's a big selling point. And I'd really like to see as we move forward, thinking about how trails, um, how parks, and how this lush tree canopy is all part of the brand for our city moving forward and something we can really leverage at this critical moment as people are developing a new relationship with their parks, uh, with their trails, and with nature. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll uh, uh, um, see the stage and give us a chance to hear from our other panelists. I look forward to the rest of the conversation. Michael, as always, um, such a compelling message. And I know you put a lot of thought into that that final slide and I, and I think it's absolutely perfect <laughs> with that it's a it's a great transition into a lot of the work that George has been doing um, leading the trust for public land and so uh, George you're you're gonna carry us forward and I can't be more excited to hear from you today You can see my screen, you cannot hear me. So now you probably can hear me. My name is George Dusenberry. Thank you, Mike and Michael for the, the setup. I am the George Alabama State Director for the Trust for Public Land. Um, I'm not gonna go into as much detail as Michael um, before coming to Trust for Public Land. I served as um, the Commissioner for Parks and Recreation. I actually um, was Michael before Michael was Michael at Park Pride and um, spent 10 years working for Congressman John Lewis uh, six years up in DC, four years down in Atlanta. Um, so the Trust Public Land is a, a national organization that creates parks and preserves lands for people. We believe that everyone deserves a park, as Michael said, and uh, for 50, nearly 50 years we have preserved land, built parks, helped governments raise funds for parks, and worked with public partners to determine how they can use parks to solve the problems that they confront. Um, Wrong thing. In 2021, our Georgia office will celebrate its 30th anniversary. As you see, we've done a lot of work around the state, um, but the areas we're probably most proud of are helping to create the Martin Luther King Jr. National Historic Site, um, helping to actually creating the um, vision, the green space vision along the Atlanta Beltline, and then going out and acquiring $47 million worth of property in the early days to help make it happen. Um, and then along the Chattahoochee River, we've been active there for almost 25 years. We've helped preserve 18,000 acres and 80 miles of riverfront. And we're excited to be embarking on kind of the next leg of that um, venture with the Atlanta Regional Commission, uh, City of Atlanta, Cobb County, Gwinnett County, and others on the Chattahoochee Riverlands, where we will be working to create a, if you will, we have 100 mile green space corridor from uh, uh, Buford Dam, uh, Lake Lanier, all the way down to Chattahoochee Bend State Park. So um, some of the stuff we're doing. Why do we do it? Michael touched a bit on this. Um, I'm going to just do a, a quick uh, reinforcement of some of the stuff he said. Oftentimes when I present, I'll ask people to close their eyes and, and go to that happy place. And I think that's something during the pandemic that more and more of us are doing. And keep their eyes closed, ask folks to raise their hands if they are in nature or if they're looking at nature. And then asking everybody to open their eyes and look around the room where 90% of the people have their hand in the air because there's, the, there's this innate connection between people and nature and the outdoors. Um, it helps with our physical health in terms of just having access to it. Uh, we are more apt to exercise. Uh, our mental health uh, it reduces stress, it reduces hypertension, it helps with cognitive thinking and even reduces cholesterol. It helps with ADHD. It's just a innate connection between land and people. Um, also, as Michael also uh, referred to reference a little bit, um, people who live near parks actually get outdoors and, and you have a stronger sense of community. Um, people know more of their neighbors. They have more friends. Uh, they're happier with where they live. And then finally, in terms of the environmental perspective, parks clean the air, they clean the water which means, again, it reinforces um, our health because um, if you go, you have the heat island effect also that, that parks help combat. And so by having parks, 
people benefit from their health with less asthma, uh, less heart disease coming from particulate matter, um, also less stormwater flooding and what have you. Um, I want to put a plug in in May of this year, and this is specific to parks and the pandemic. Um, the Trust for Public Land went and took a look of, of how we as a country were responding to the pandemic and the outsized role that parks were beginning to play. This is an attachment, um, a handout as part of the webinar. Um, I'm not going to go too much into detail uh, about it, but one thing I would like to relate to this is that the, uh, the Trust for Public Land currently is working with APS, with Park Pride and the Urban Land Institute on this community schoolyard program. And the goal of the program is to have schoolyards available to the general public during non-school use so that more people can have access to a safe close to home park. And what we're seeing a little bit down the pandemic is kind of an inversion of this where these schoolyards now are providing an opportunity for us to safely educate our children. Um, this is a conversation that's happening in New York City. You know, you have these dense environments and you want, we want to bring kids safely back to school. How do we do that? Well, outdoor classrooms. And this is something that goes back um, to the early 1900s that Michael was referencing. Uh, Vermont, actually, of all states, has always had um, and maintained outdoor classrooms. Even in the dead of winter, they're out there teaching their kids. And so that's just one of those unique ways that parks help us respond to the pandemic. As far as uh, the Trust Park Lands approach to parks and green space, community is at the heart of our work. And we approach it through the three lenses of equity, public health, and climate resilience. Um, a good local ex example of uh, climate resilience, uh, Michael mentioned uh, stormwater flooding. We currently are working with the city to build Cook Park on the west side of Atlanta. It's a sister park, historic Fourth Ward Park. Um, at the end of the day, that park is going to be able to hold 10, millions of gallons of, 10 million gallons of stormwater at a single time, which will help eliminate um, flooding for 160 acres around the park. The park itself actually is located where 160 families lived up until 2002 when they were flooded out by a horrific flood. So it's a, a good repurposing of that land. Um, the pandemic has amplified the need to access for parks and also the disparate the disparate health incomes already impacting poor communities of color. There's a common saying in public health that zip codes are more likely than our genetic code to predict health outcomes. And um, unfortunately, there are disparities in access to parks and nature. Uh, the Trust Public Land did a national analysis and found that on average, parks in non-white neighborhoods are half the size of parks in majority white neighborhoods while serving five times as many people. Um, to put this into context, that would be in a majority white community, you would have a 10 acre park serving 3,000 people. In a majority minority community, you would have a five acre park and half the size serving 15,000 people. Uh, this goes to the um, racial equity issues that Michael had mentioned. And it's not just race, it's also um, income. Um, parks in majority low income communities are about a quarter the size of as parks in majority high income communities and certainly four times as many people. So you're aware of food deserts. You're aware of the growing rural health deserts as we're seeing more hospitals close. We also have park deserts and too often they are in disadvantaged communities. Across the country, more than 100 million people and trust me has mapped this, do not have access to a safe close to home park, including 28 million children. In the city of Atlanta, nearly 135,000 people do not have access to a close to home park including 30,000 children. To help in this regard, um, Trust Public Land actually has uh, created something called ParkServe. And here you see at the top of the slide, www.tpl.org backslash ParkServe. I'm gonna try to hyperlink this. But basically you can go look up any city in America. Um, Trust Public Land has mapped all these cities and created this database with some good GIS stuff that I'm sure Mike would be very um, proud of. And let's just see how my internet's working. So you're actually live on the website. And you go to Marietta and you'll see who has access to parks. It breaks it down demographically by age, um, by income, and by race and ethnicity. And then you can dig even further. And we have these interactive maps where you go down to the parcel level. And this is for the geeks, mind you, where you can see where the parks exist. And then you can also see who lives in walking distance of that park. And um, in the red areas, we basically overlay the demographic data in terms of. Um, ethnicity, children, and income, 
and identify those areas most in need of parks. So here you see you know, Merritt has got some really solid parks. It's got kind of some um, Mountain National Battlefield. Here's um, the Chattahoochee, some nice green space. But there are some pockets, and we even prioritize them where we need parks. Again, the Trust Public Land has done this for every city in America. Um, so I encourage you, if you want to, to take a look at that. So unfortunately, you know, our built environment was designed, not designed with equity in mind, but we can change that. And tools like that are how the Trust Public works with communities to do just that. Um, turning now to the regional component, what Michael was talking about and the importance of trails. Uh, beginning a couple years ago, the Trust Public Land started hosting the Georgia Trail Summit. I want to put a good plug into it because this is where we bring together the, the thought leaders and the community leaders and the government leaders and the corporate leaders who are really invested in trails and creating that um, interactive, connective um, vision for what Metro Atlanta can be and what the state can be. It's coming up November 9th and 10th. Um, it is virtual. Um, we originally were going to be um, in Augusta in May, and it's um, less than $100 to register. So if you go to georgiatrailsummit.com, I encourage you to go there and register. We have two four-hour morning sessions, um, breaking it up, and we're going to do, try to do as well with our conference as uh, Park Pride did with their conference. So um, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. And I do not know how I stopped sharing the screen. I think I can figure this out right here. Oh, Jared is the wizard there behind us. I think yeah. I did it myself, Michael, yeah, no help. You know, just try to be faster. But I do want to point out that I, I oftentimes see Mike on the platform at five points as we're waiting um, to come back from the Atlanta United games, usually from Atlanta United victory. Um, there have not been many of them this year. <laughs> not anymore. So, yeah, thank you. And, uh, but George, it's just amazing work and your commitment to Atlanta, metropolitan Atlanta, um, is is something that I, I'm just glad I know you. And you're my city, one of my city council members as well in the city of Decatur. So George is so committed to the community, as you can feel Michael is. And just a short story to illustrate this. You know, more than two years ago, a friend of ours, Eric Meyer, said, hey, we want to come and talk to you about a study. And that's that's ARC code. And they want to pitch something to us. They want to get funded. And and George walks in with Eric and walks in with some staff from the city of Atlanta. And what that meant was Cobb County, the city of Atlanta and George were talking about a huge study of the Chattahoochee River. And the minute I realized that they were collaborating, you had me at hello. And so when you work in the regional space that I work in, you see multiple governments working together to uh, to think about our most prized environmental resource, the Chattahoochee River. It was just a beautiful moment. And it's been fun for Georgia and everybody else to watch that study come to fruition. And now we're gonna start to implement it. And so these other stories that we're about to transition into, I think really speak to the implementation and what that can mean. And with that, we're going to turn it over to Ravonda, if that's okay. That is there okay. I, I hope that someone is in control of the slides and all of those amazing things. We can uh, we can do that, Jared. Um, Thank do you, you want so me much. To, do you want me to do it, or do you <clears> want to do it? Hopefully, Jared's Thank still you, with Mike. us. George and Michael, um, it's, it's always wonderful to be in your company. And um, today, it's pretty easy to follow you because I could just say ditto. Um, <laughs> I've been many things in this almost 15 years in uh, now the metro Atlanta area without saying how old I am. <laughs> um, but I am most proud of this new role I'm in. I'm the executive director of the Arabia Mountain Heritage Area Alliance, and the alliance oversees the NHA. And I know that's a lot of soup, but nonetheless, the alliance, which is a national nonprofit um, designated by Congress in 2006, our Hank Johnson, um, made it possible. And he, along with some amazing um, I call them caregivers. I really call one of them a quilter, and I hope he's listening. But Kelly Jordan and Becky Kelly got together and knitted something amazing. 
And the one thing that I don't have to try to take credit for, and I think it's pretty tough to upstage me on, I think, Mike, you agree, a 400 million year old Monadnock was obviously here before any of us and left its amazing imprint and outcrop. And while all the things that come up out of that stone mountain are um, small, they are mighty. And so are the communities that are around it. Um, so before I go any further, um, I'm new at this. I'm new at the ED and what parks people and programs and pandemics look like now are the life I envisioned when I left construction engineering, <laughs> nuclear construction and leaped into this field because I heard the word environmental being used in a right way many, 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 many administrations ago um, by a guy from my town. I'm from Tennessee. So I'll leave it at that and say I'm an SEC supporter. And I know that all the dogs are smiling at me right now. So um, go to the next slide if you don't mind. But I want to I want to just say that what I think has most changed is how people find us now. Um, as an alliance, I get to really just help. I don't own anything, no structures, no buildings. The rock is not even mine, but there are a host of partners stretched out in what is 40,000 acres, three counties. Uh, one of the most dense counties in Georgia happens to be DeKalb County, a little over 800,000 residents. Um, and so that county, Rockdale and Henry, make up this amazing geographical space that's full of culture, history, arts, um, stories that date back, uh, people, to a time when um, none of us were around, but things were certainly different. And so I get the pleasure of watching people now find their way to us when it matters. Um, all of our spaces, the leadership in most of those counties and cities in the midst of a pandemic have been crystal clear on what's open and what's not and what's safe. So, Coming up with programs, if you'll go to the next slide, has not been the hardest thing for me, but what it has been, it's more of this. I don't need a program when we have 33 miles of paved trail, partnership with PATH. Um, I think below, I'm pretty sure that's a portion of the South River. Partners and friends like SRWA, Dr. Jacqueline Ankles, we're all nodding our heads. I don't need a program when you can access water safely and you're told how and where to do it and entrance and exit points exist and um, residents and, and everyone alike from small children understand urban waterways and when it's safe to get in and the pressures of consent decree. And so um, the other things that you see are people taking photos, uh, they're watching birds, nature, one another, climate change, rocks, turtles, uh, you name it. Of the Piedmont Forest. And so that has really opened up uh, how we get to assist in a pandemic. And then that bottom picture in the right corner is one of my favorites. And um, it's the children that come out when we are unable to gather, they still tune into our programs virtually. Two amazing staff members uh, reinvented themselves and started telling our stories virtually. First, with a historic tour of Slack Cemetery on Juneteenth, which, if you'd asked me before the pandemic or before the last four murders in the African American community, definitely before Rayshard Brooks, did I think we'd be this popular? I might not have said so. But to Betsy and Mike and Michael and George, this is who we were. So the Alliance of National Heritage Areas, when I think about change, this 55 member area of National Heritage Areas that represents more than 45 million voters, this is a great place to be. And it is not hard to watch the change that people are making in their own lives by coming into our spaces. Um, one other thing I think about, and I, and I know I'll get some high fives from the panelists, the Georgia Outdoor Stewardship Program changed our footprint. And for all of the taxpayers, the millennials, those of you who didn't know what you did, you just changed the game. You just helped 
Peachtree Creek Greenway. You make life possible for Michael and all the programs that he's gonna come back with because he is the volunteer park guy. Uh, Mr. Dusenberry, no stranger to innovation, amazing ideas, 10, 20 years. Obviously he doesn't age, not going anywhere. So you all changed a lot for us, but in a, in a real way you did. You said you understood what we do. And so now I get a lot of calls around the world, the region, the state, the country, from DC, from congressional leaders, men and women, and we don't always have everything in common. But in this time, we are finding ways, next slide please, to work together. And that is what is, it's not different. I want it to be the new norm. It's not different because we've all always worked together. And so some of these pictures that I'm going to show you are the partners that are in the National Heritage Area. Uh, the monastery over in uh, Conyers, that community said to us immediately when I called to check on them, Betsy, <laughs> you all live like we do now. Everybody's a monk. You can't go anywhere. <laughs> so I'm finding that our lives are really not that different when we are locked indoors. It's not. We still are looking for quiet places, groceries, running water, the Wi-Fi to work. Hopefully my dog doesn't come running through here right now. So those are some of the things that are different. That landscape you're looking at on the left, if it's on your left, is the Vauders Barn uh, uh, landscape, one of the oldest agriculture landscapes in DeKalb County. And if it were not for one man and his uh, farm and his family's values around conservation and how hard he had worked <laughs> and, and refusing to say that land should be anything else and to get with people like the Nature Conservancy and Kelly Jordan and leadership at Panola Mountain State Park and now make that something that we can hike through, walk through, bike through, plant in. Even HBO came and filmed a film in the barn it's okay. So those are the things that I'm noticing when I say, you know, what is it like now to be outdoors in the green space business or in recreation leisure? I can bring everybody to work with me now. They want to come. So um, those are some of the things I think about. Lastly, visitor experience. Staff, board, partners, everybody you see on here, we're in this. But for visitors who do not know what they are about to walk into when they get to Arabia Mountain, the National Heritage Area, or any of the amazing places that have been described, the Beltline Project, Chattahoochee, if they are tourists or first time visitors are stuck on a flight, or they've got a quarantine here for 14 days, they find that they have fallen into something they did not expect. This is not the Georgia they knew. This is not the region. This is not what's on TV. To a great extent, it is. Our friends at, you know, the safe places, NPR, WABE, Georgia Public Broadcasting, they tell our stories. So um, I think people to people is the business that we're permanently in. I had a Emory doctor say recently, in a conversation that had these four words, but it ended in mental health say that we are not socially distanced. We should be physically distanced, but socially connected. And that we should begin to look at how we say that and what that means to um, people who don't get out, regardless if they were outdoor or not. So it led me to think of lifelong learners, uh, how to reach inbound seniors, how to reach um, PTSD. Uh, we all are gonna be that now, even without wars or veteran service. How to reach um, special needs adults and children. My green spaces are full of those. And those are the things that I'm noticing, I'll go to the next slide, that are drastically different, Mike, when I, when I think about what's different. And then lastly, it has given um, I think Michael and George and Betsy are overachievers. I'm not a workaholic, but I think we are working more <laughs> during the pandemic because we like it. 
we're connected to it. You can't see our bottom halves. We can get more done. And so we are. So this is our attempts after about seven or eight months of not coming out of our homes and safe spaces and compromising one another's one another to grab masks and partner with what yet another agency and still get out there and renovate old historic structures, which happen to be the oldest African American community in DeKalb County, Flat Rock Archives. Um, you see students following us at a safe distance from Roswell to see the historic cemeteries that saw Mr. Waits on a virtual historic tour. And so then they called us and said, hey, can we come over? We can spread out. So th this, this is what I'm beginning to see. I'm also seeing a return of everyone say to us after visiting, how can I give? How can I lead? How can I support? They know volunteer looks different. They do. But I can certainly help you with supporting, leading, or giving. And so I'm, I'm, I'm finding ways to do that now. Um, I think regionally, for me to have been a part of the Green Communities Movement Initiative under ARC already for DeKalb County some years ago, I think we have an opportunity to, to continue the great work, to tell a broader story, to most importantly raise a group of professionals that want to do what we do that want to be George, that want to be Michael, that want to be Mike, that want to be Betsy, that want to be the leadership and stand in creeks and go to coastal lines and, you know, not spray mosquitoes and plant pollinator gardens and partner with Linda Cotton Taylors of the world. I, I think that's where we are. I think that's the change that I'd hope we saw. And I feel like we really are seeing it. It feels amazingly well to be supported by leadership across the board. They're turning to us, parks departments, cities, counties, trail planners, and saying, what can we do? You all are always talking about this. How do we do it now? And then lastly, um, I would be remiss not to say this, heritage tourism, heritage tourism, agriculture tourism. We had a former governor, I went to his uh, wife's 4-H Center, not far from here. And we didn't always see eye to eye on everything either, but he was clear about agriculture tourism. He was clear about heritage and what this region meant. And that's not political. And so I'm extremely excited about that. Thank you so much from the heritage area. I'm Ravonda Cosby. Uh, thank you so much, Ravonda. I mean, that was um, inspirational. It really is. Uh, and again, I can certainly feel your passion for the heritage area. And as a avid cyclist that got his courage to first bike out there because of Michael, I can tell you it is one of the most scenic places in the area. And you got the Ranger hat on now. Um, but it's not flat. <laughs> Be aware of that. It's good topography, but it is one of the most um, spectacular places in this region. And if you're on this webinar and you haven't you haven't um, traveled every trail in that area, you are really missing a big part of the environmental story of, of, of Metro Atlanta. And along those lines, environmental stories, um, Betsy, you want to take over and tell the story of the Peachtree Creek Greenway because uh, this is another story that I absolutely love and where it is means so much to this conversation we're having right now. And so, um, Jared, are you you're going to go yourself, I think, right, Betsy? With the I think so. Let me uh, see if you can see this. Actually, Betsy, because um, you're using a yeah. Mac, and gets... Um, I'm gonna just pause for a second, start your slideshow mode, and then I'm going to and then restart the, um, I'll share this, give you control to share the screen. So start the slideshow, but just give me a second. Thank you. All right. 
Jared has it figured out now. I absolutely trust him. He he's probably done 30 of these now. One for Jared, we love you. Thank you. <laughs> no. He's our unsung hero. How's that? Can y'all see that? Yep, it's good. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Those were great presentations, and I'll go through mine um, quickly here. Let me know if there's a problem. So, the Peachtree Creek Greenway was started in 2013 to advocate for a plan that was actually part of the Arabia Mountain Trail system, the Stone Mountain system. These were all DeKalb County trails, part of a plan that was um, embraced in the year 2000. And really, for those first 13 years, nothing much had been done at all, really, for the Peachtree Creek Greenway. Uh, it runs through Atlanta now, Brookhaven, Shambly, unincorporated DeKalb County, and Doraville. That's the aspirational trail. And I'll tell you more about where it is now and how we got there. Um, this is the 285 perimeter that goes around Atlanta. 85 is the northeast portion of that, like a pie, a cut in the pie. And alongside 85 is the North Fork of Peachtree Creek. Down um, at the very southwestern edge is the city of Atlanta. There's about um, maybe a three quarter mile of the Greenway that will be going through there. There's three miles of the Greenway going through Brookhaven, one mile in Shambly going through Century Center, and then about six to eight miles going through um, both unincorporated DeKalb County and then a north spur goes to Doraville's Marta Station. And we've actually found a way for it to go underneath 285 at Spaghetti Junction going into the Atlanta Silverback Stadium there. Um, what we've done so far as an organization is to convince Doraville to put $460,000 in SWAS money to go toward the Peachtree Creek Greenway. In unincorporated DeKalb County, we have had multiple actually trail meetings during COVID. And when we talk about COVID, that's something that people can do. This photograph was uh, taken on the section of the Greenway already built in Brookhaven. And these are board members along with Dave Pelton, who is the head of transportation in DeKalb County, and Chuck Ellis, who is the head of Parks and Recs. Um, another mm -hmm. meeting that we've had since COVID included ARC's Byron Rushing with this most of the people in this same group, including the two directors in transportation and parks. Right. Um, those of you interested in building part of uh, multi-use trails to connect schools and places of work and parks to one another for people, um, these are the kind of people that you'll be interfacing with, part of the three legs of the stool. One are elected officials and the planning departments of those different cities and counties. Then there are the property owners and the advocacy groups. So those are the three legs of the stool that you have to have in place to get it all rolling. Um, as we go, as the river flows heading south, we go into the city of Shambly. As I mentioned, there's one mile going through Shambly. Um, Shambly in 2019 added the Peachtree Creek Greenway into their transportation plan specifically and showed where it's going to go through Century Center. Um, mm -hmm. If you'll know, if you happen to know where Sam's Club is and Claremont Road, where that Claremont Road and ID5 intersection is, that's within a block of where the Greenway will go underneath Claremont Road. This year, during COVID, we had a great victory um, in working with the city of Shambly, we had an elected official who totally was an advocate for us, and he was able to get the universal designs for the Peachtree Creek Greenway onto the zoning ordinance. I wanted to mention, too, that when you look at this whole corridor and look at issues around equity, the Cross Keys High School 
area is all up and down Buford Highway and I-85, many, many apartment complexes with kids to go to the Cross Keys High School um, group. And there are over 15,000 apartments north of the Peachtree Creek. And then there's also many, many apartments south along the access roads. Um, in Brookhaven, the three miles in Brookhaven, the first mile was complete in December of 2019. And I'll show you some slides of what that looks like in a minute. And um, I hope that you'll be able to go there. There are three places to park your car to drive there. And it's 1.2 miles. It was funded through the hotel motel tax that was increased at a state level for the city of Brookhaven. And they leveraged that um, money with a revenue bond to get the first chunk of funding for the middle mile. Um, there is a second phase and a third phase that uh, is looking to ARC funding with federal dollars, which we're grateful for. And we had mentioned mm -hmm. earlier the um, Georgia Outdoor Stewardship Program. And in Atlanta, along with the PATH Foundation and the funding from the Georgia Outdoor Stewardship Program, along with South Fork Conservancy, will be the first actual concrete paved section of the Peachtree Creek Greenway that will go underneath uh, at the southernmost portion in that area, which will connect Peachtree Creek Greenway to Path 400 and on to uh, the Beltline's connection where it's coming in toward the Lindbergh Marta station. Betsy, what's that connection called? I think there's a fun name for that connection. Oh, there is. There's a great name for that connection. It's called the Angel Hair Pasta Spaghetti Junction for Trails. <laughs> so I'm, I'm showing here uh, where the stars are. I'm going to show you some pictures that we have. Some of them are hopeful pictures and some are ac actual pictures um, coming up in the at the end of the slideshow. So here's what in Brookhaven, what this model mile looks like. Um, the section that was opened last December. As you can see, it's paved so that we have users in walkers, wheelchairs, on bikes, um, families with strollers. Uh, it's open from 6 a.m. until 11 p.m. and it's lit. And there is our mayor um, cutting the ribbon along with some of uh, the fans of Brookhaven and the, and the Greenway there at the uh, grand opening. These are some of the specifications for the universal design standards for the Peachtree Creek Greenway. These are already implemented in Brookhaven and they are part of the zoning ordinance in the next city northward, Chambly. We're hoping to bring these forward in unincorporated DeKalb County. So if we have any DeKalb County residents, you might want to just talk to anybody that you know in government there uh, to encourage them to pull in there. We want to make sure it's a universal trail that as you go from one jurisdiction to another, it, it works well and isn't like a skinny little gravel trail and then something big and lit and um, a different feel. Um, so we have really something for everyone. In case you haven't been to the Greenway, um, I'll show you this little uh, quick video. There's the Peachtree Creek. And the man on the right is a man on the right is a man that we we met um, through next door. He had called out saying, "My cardiologist said I need to start riding my bicycle. I haven't ridden in 40 years since I used to be a, a newspaper delivery boy, and I'm scared to death to be changing gears." So my husband and I took Danny out on the trail and he was so happy and so excited. He just loved it. So um, it's, I, I'm not crazy about next door so much, but this was a wonderful outcome um, during times of COVID. And that's that we've seen so many people on bikes in local streets, um, kids on bikes. And this is a way where they can get out and try out how safe they feel on a bike in a very non-car um, 
area. So these are um, before and after pictures. This is what Brookhaven's underneath corporate boulevard looked like in 2017, and this is what it looks like now. The, uh, these others are what um, we had a company uh, led by Carlos Perez. He did these designs for us. He took the photographs and then he changed them to what they will look like when you add a multi-use trail. So this goes under a bridge. It actually is underneath 285. Um, near Claremont Road, it connects Shambly to unincorporated DeKalb County. Here are some other pictures. There's Shalliford Exchange, which there's a Publix on Shalliford Road right next to I-85. There's lots and lots of apartment complex up and down um, that section of the Northeast Expressway. This is the before, which is the current. And this is what we hope it will look like in the future. This last photograph on the bottom right hand side is um, our four or five box culverts that go underneath Spaghetti Junction and you can't really see but up at the same level where the sky seems to meet some clouds that's actually one of the big flyover roads of 285 and we were able to walk through these tunnels and get to the other side and this shows how a box culvert can be changed into a multi-use trail so that um, is aspirational we look to neighbors um, people here today where i'm so grateful for all of you who took time out from your Thursday afternoon to be part of this uh, and look forward to hearing from you all with your questions. Thanks so much. I think we, thank you so much, Betsy. And I'm, 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 I'm going to reshow my screen in just a second. Um, and this really should start this conversation. I feel like we're already at that place where we're having a conversation. Um, and again, I wanna emphasize the pandemic has changed the way we think about parks. I think all of us that work in, in planning and parks planning and parks implementation and fundraising, which is something uh, uh, all of you know something about, recognize this change. And I, I want to ask specifically uh, to anybody who wants to respond initially, given that there's so much new interest, are you feeling a change in some of the critical things we know we've struggled with? Do you think there'll be more funding available long term for parks? And if so, you know, um, what can we do to support that as a community of people that are really interested in it? Uh, insofar as, you know, our own personal checkbooks are limited but we'd certainly like to try to make sure that um, we expand our park system uh, and that our parks are funded just for maintenance, which is something we'd talked about, uh, George and Michael and, and Betsy and yeah. Vonda, that you know, the pandemic doesn't mean that these costs are gonna get any less. In fact, if people really recognize the value, they're gonna want more. Uh, Michael, do you wanna maybe start with that? Sure. And then, Betsy, you raise your hand. First off, I will say that we're kind of in this best of times, worst of times situation, because on the one hand, people are using parks more frequently than before. And in some ways, our audience has broadened. There's more different types of people using parks. Uh, but we're also finding that the parks departments themselves are um, facing budget cuts. And as we're dealing with the economic downturn, we're seeing um, a lot of stresses that have been put on the system to, to accommodate that increased use. So, and I think just in terms of my organization being a, a, a locally based nonprofit, um, that um, there also have been some struggles that we've had from a financial standpoint. So we have kind of some near term um, issues of scarce of, of scarce resources. Right. Um, and I think that that's something that we're, we're dealing with. The thing that I will say is, as I look at the bigger play for what is going to be happening over the long term, and some of the things we've been talking about, how parks are filling different um, roles than they have played in the past. Um, I was on a call um, yesterday, I believe it was, with Frank Fernandez, the new head of the Community Foundation, 
and he talked about the concept of intersectionality. And basically the way that I translate that to this conversation is, there are folks that support parks just for their own sake. And there are park people out there and there are foundations that will support that work. And that's one kind of base uh, part of our audience. And then there's people that in my way of thinking about it are parks people, they just don't know it yet. <laughs> and those are the people who might care about um, issues of uh, community stabilization and how parks could fit into efforts to make it so a community has a sense of ownership over the park in their area. And it's also developed in a way that's not pushing out existing residents. Right. And there are folks that will be interested in those issues and want to fund those that work. Um, in recent years, in our efforts in the city of Atlanta, there hasn't been a lot of capital dollars for parks. A lot of the dollars have actually come from green infrastructure dollars coming from watershed, and George can speak yeah. to this point. Um, and then on the trail side of things, that parks are, you know, that trails are also transportation. So I think that really the future looks like um, a, an effort that's looking at the role of parks and trails as part of something bigger, and then figuring out ways that from an intersectionality standpoint that we're selling those shared benefits for all those different areas as opposed to just looking at parks off as kind of a nice to have amenity. Ravonda, you wanna go and then George? Sure, just, just one quick point. Um, I, I know for us, when I say tourism and economic development, they go together. And so that GOSP model started out of something similar, like mine, great city, network, we all put it together. And so I think for us, we are working on a model that can marry deferred maintenance to economic development and the impact that filmmakers and others have on our outdoor spaces to include the casual user. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a greater way to share deferred maintenance because we all know when you build a house, if you don't ever come back and do anything, it doesn't get better, but it stays a house, but it, 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 it begins to, to change just a little. And so outdoor spaces and spaces we you know protect and conserve are no different. And so I think that's, that's a simple layman way to begin to educate people because they've all been indoors here recently. And so they've done the same thing. They've taken their house, which is their park or their mountain, and been in it long enough to know what they need to do to make it more you know, inhabitable, livable, Mike, you know. And so to me, um, that's the model that I'm gonna undertake and, and the Alliance is, is supporting us in, in creating how to marry deferred maintenance to drive and then brand that so that all of us tell this fabric of stories because everywhere I go, I tell all of these other stories. I don't just tell mine because they may just not know me or the NHA, but they may know, and they do, the Beltline. They do know the Chattahoochee. They will know the Greenway. They do know volunteerism and the word Park Pride. So I think it's important that we tell a combined story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. you feel that, I think that there's a lot also happening at the national level. We mentioned how the George Outdoor Stewardship uh, Amendment passed. This uh, summer, uh, Congress passed and the president signed a law, the Great American Outdoors Act. It doubles the amount of federal funding that is going to states for land acquisition and park building. It provides $2 billion over five years for deferred maintenance. So Ravonda, I'm sure you need to get in line and get some of that money. I'm sure that you've already thinking along those lines. Um, oh. So we also anticipate um, you know, next year, some kind of economic stimulus package um, just because of the impact of the pandemic. And there's an opportunity to get funding for parks and green space and trails as part of that. So great opportunity there. And then, you know, that conversation I was with Michael and, and uh, Frank Fernandez. And part of that is that in, in Ravonna talked about this, putting people back to work, get them in the parks, um, do some job um, development, work with groups like the Green Youth Foundation to train folks and get them out there. Um, because people want to see their parks well maintained and they if they can see tangible investments and benefits it'll pay dividends so I, I'm hopeful that as we respond to the pandemic by embracing parks with visiting them we also embrace parks in terms of making those investments not just in fancy new shiny things but in the the bread and butter operation maintenance 
The mm -hmm. last thing I touch on is in May or June, um, I was meeting with one of the biggest foundations in Georgia. And everything at that point in time is, Mike, as you would imagine, pandemic, pandemic, pandemic. And all the funds pretty much of every foundation were going toward the pandemic. But what they said to me was they said, you know, look, short term, you know, parks and green space are not a priority. But you will <laughs> never have to make the case for parks and green space again because yeah. that is where we're seeing more and more people turn to. So I think long term, there's that acknowledgement and embrace that it is integral to us as people. So yeah, George, that's the kind of point that yeah. really makes the case for these webinars. I'm so glad I got to hear you say that today. Yeah. You know, may, may I may I also too, but go ahead, please, Ravana. Just and we real quick. I, I know we have questions. I just want to add when we all think about the premise under which the NPS National Park System was given to us um, initially under under the Roosevelt administration and how we got here, uh, people have always been in parks and on the land and in natural spaces, and they have done their best when they've been able to. Even as we've evolved as civilizations and through technology, we know that land and water and, and access to those spaces make us better. So I'm glad to just kind of remind everyone of that. You know, and NPS has an amazing story in uh, National Recreation and Parks and Cultural Affairs, the national organization uh, and other players. I think it's time for us to all just kind of get on the same sheet of music and what we're saying it means from a financial impact. Right, right. And with that, um. I told you we've got we've got um, some pretty technical people on this webinar today, and Andrea Greco asked a question for for Betsy on Peachtree Creek Greenway. What is the max slope you have out there? And two, <laughs> are there any plans to connect it eastward towards the path in the Emory Mason Mill area post pandemic? What opportunity does everyone <laughs> see for greater connectivity between? these currently disparate multi-use trails and accompanying green spaces. And I don't, how I'm trying to scroll. There have there a been way a that I can see it too, Mike. I can't see his, that person's question. Yeah, that's why I'm and reading it's so it. Long I so forgot, what the, was the very first thing he asked? The max slope on the trail so far, grade. Um, and then, uh, are there any plans to connect it eastward? Um, do I look like an engineer? No. <laughs> I, I don't well, we've know got a nuclear slope. engineer on it the call. Means, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it meets the, um, it, it, it meets the, I think it's the one to 10 standard that, that is yeah. the NACTO standard. Okay. So, um, I, that's what I'm going to have to say, not being an engineer, 1 to 10, not 1 to 12, but it's it meets ADA standards for NACTO, which is, I think, 1 to 10, but it's not 1 to 12. But if you ride a bike, it will it's not quite as flat as what a rail to trail would feel like because there is some ups and downs. As far as the connectivity to Emory and beyond, that is... For our organization of all volunteers, y'all are on your own. And that's what I encourage everybody to do, to look at what different trails look like and bring it to your own area. Because um, we already have 12 miles and it does, it's, all, it's along the North Fork and it follows the map that I showed. And um, I encourage you to continue to uh, continue the trails that are in Emory um, near the VA hospital and bring them to the Greenway through your neighborhoods. So what you're saying is you're gonna stay focused. I, I'm trying, I've got, I don't have that many years left as a, <laughs> and then we're gonna stay focused on the North Fork. Um, but I think Mike, if there's an area that I would yeah. encourage people to go to, it would be uh, the Georgia Trail Summit that George mentioned earlier as a way of connecting with like-minded right. individuals and looking at how you um, can be a part of the change you wish to see in the world. That's yeah. Right. So George, I built yes. you a slide too. That should be the slide that's up right now as a yep. trail. Thank you. I, I appreciate that, Mike. Yeah. So you brought it up, and I wanted to put that in the end. I've got a pitch for the State of the Region breakfast at the very end, but. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great point. 
and it and it, the next question from Zach um, really gets at this. And like post pandemic, and this is for everyone. Um, do we see greater connectivity between the currently disparate multi-use trails and accompanying green spaces? Are there opportunities for greater connectivity? So and of course, I, if, if I could jump in, one thing that came out of the Trail Summit last year was the creation of this George Outdoor Recreation Coalition. And a number of these folks here are, are members. And um, we have four goals. And one of those actually is a statewide trails master plan. As you know, um, you know, ARC, some of the regional commissions done a really good job with bike plan plans. Um, but our sense is, and as you also know, money follows the plans. So we're advocating for that. I think there is hope and there is momentum. Um, we're seeing it in the region. Um, so I would say yes. Um, and um, let's just keep working at it. As, as Michael said, people who want to get things done, um, Give me a call. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Betsy, I think Betsy mentioned mentioned Byron Rushing, who's in our transportation. Yep. If there yeah. is one human being that is relentlessly focused on connecting the regional trail network and partnering with mm -hmm. everyone, it is Byron Rushing. He is, and he wouldn't like me to say this, but he is a genius, and um, he, he knows as much about it as anybody on the planet. And so if you ever want, you just put in the chat that you want to talk to Byron, um, you'll get a great conversation. He's changed the way I thought as a planner about the way we think about safety and trails access. And yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, it's a great comment. Michael. I wanted, I'll, I wanted I'll to mention add, that. Go ahead, Betsy. Go well, ahead, I was going to say the Beltline is a trail of regional significance, but it's only in one city. Um, sure. And so it, in some ways easier to just have a one city connectivity. And when we look at regional trails, that is sort of ARC's look of this big picture of how, you know, you don't want to go to one county line and then have trails not aligned up. And I, I think um, ARC plays that role in really connecting the trails together. And I'm grateful that the Greenway has been designated a trail of regional significance. And we're looking at how to get that end piece into Gwinnett right beyond Silverback Stadium. So we welcome Gwinnett coming to the Greenway. Yeah. And I'll just add that I, I think that it's interesting you brought up the Beltline because the, the thought that came to my mind was when the East Side Trail opened, there are people who walked the short distance from Irwin Street over uh, to the Piedmont Park and realized how close those areas were and it blew people's mm -hmm. minds. And uh, folks that were involved in selling the future investments in the Beltline said that that changed the conversation fundamentally because up until that point, they were just selling air. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think the idea of a regional tra tra uh, trail network and the prep for this call um, Mike was talking about, wouldn't it be great to get to that moment where you could get on path, you go to the Beltline, you go to Silver Comet, you go all the way out to Alabama. When people actually have these moments of regional connectivity with trails, it's mm -hmm. going to change the way we think. It's going to change the way we use these different areas in terms of recreation and having overnight trips and things along those lines. So I think that the biggest issue is not the technical know-how or the planning. It's that kind of um, that kind of push where um, there's a saying in the environmental community that uh, politicians are like weather vanes and our job is to make the winds blow. I think to the degree that people are demanding a regional trail network, we will have a regional trail network. We will. And there are ways that things like the Beltline initially seemed like something that was never going to happen. And now I think the biggest challenges with the Beltline is that it feels inevitable. So it's more of a how do we make sure we get it right sure. because it isn't a question of whether or not it's going to happen. It's more it of, kind of the, the details of the execution. So it, I think that if there's anything, if there's one thing I ask people to kind of come away from this, it isn't the experts. It's kind of the groundswell that's going to get us to the trails and the parks that we need in that regional vision. Yeah. Amen. All right. And so, um, this is from Christine Williams. There have been a lot of comments regarding accessibility of trails. I know we talked about it. Uh, and parks for all. What's the plan to ensure that the building expansion of green space and trails doesn't economically push out those people 
um, that the green space is there to serve, which I think is a fundamental question. Mm -hmm. I'd like to, to start it off, and I know everyone has a, an opinion, um, but I certainly think that it is in three core principles, um, transparency, authenticity, and communication, and those of us that are the stakeholders, if we are the designers, are the folks responsible for funding, are those that take equity and accessibility serious, we have to be those things. We cannot design for the communities who aren't our communities in the sense of without asking them, not guiding them, not guiding them, not showing them, but asking them. We all know engagement well. And so I just think we have an amazing chance and I think people have time to, to jump in at this design charrette level of mounting grand swell enthusiasm and, and ride the wave. But I do think that those of us that are in the business, the experts, Michael says, you know, the 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 know, the know the folks that are in the know, we have to remain authentic, transparent, and we have to communicate concisely on behalf of the people that we represent. Not just because we can drive this work. That's not it. Mm -hmm. And something that, I mean, Trust But Land has always talked about being land for people. And I think Park Pride has a, a same ethos. It's not about the land and the place, it's really about the people. And it's about those authentic conversations and asking the questions. Um, when, when we talk internally at Trust Public Land, it's, your first job is to listen. Because um, you can't understand if, if you're talking. It was it God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason? Um, <laughs> and that, that's just, that's a lot of it. And you also have to be intentional. You need to go in knowing that displacement, gentrification can be an issue before you even have the first conversation about parks and green space. And so that's just, I, I think that this whole community is, is woken up and embraced that. And we've had some experiences and, and I'm not gonna say that Trust Part Land's gotten it right every time, um, but we definitely are committed to trying to figure it out. I think um, what the West Side Future Fund is doing on the West Side of Atlanta in terms of integrating new green spaces, such as Captain Johnson Park, which Park Pride's building, um, Cook Park, which we're building with the city, but also looking at you know, cradle the grave, education, career building, looking at housing. I mean, it's just it's just holistic look and, and recognizing that you need to take that approach. It's about communities, it's not about public space. What we're doing is about people. So I would I would agree with everything that um our, our other speakers have just said. The only thing I would add to that is I have really been looking at some of the missed opportunities um, when I think about concurrent development. And so right now there is a push within the region to look at funding for affordable housing. And if we don't figure out ways that that's being done, looking at parks and transportation um, along with affordable housing together, then the affordable housing will be the housing that the market will dictate are places that you don't have any parks and have the worst transportation options. So I think we need to figure out a way that we're planning these efforts in concert and when we're not, and when you think about philanthropic dollars as well as public investment, in some ways, the way that we um, approach things in these different silos actually has public and public dollars and private philanthropy working against the interest of existing residents. And I think that's something that we really need to move beyond. And I also think that um, today, philanthropic uh, funder, philanthropic uh, supporters. I think are ready for more integrated approaches that look at how do we protect affordable housing, protect existing residents uh, while we improve and create parks. So I think that that's something that I'd like to see us do a lot more of. I think that within the city of Atlanta, Terry Lee with the chief housing officer has been a leader on this front. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we're hearing more of a, a, um, an interest from park professionals uh, the National Recreation Parks Association had an article at the end of last year where they had a quote that said, gone are the days that park professionals think they can do, they can say, I just do parks. And the truth of the matter is that we're not exactly there yet. I think I hear an awful lot of that uh, still to this day, but I think we have an opportunity to look at concurrent mm -hmm. development. So we develop affordable housing, we protect existing residents and we create and improve parks. Well put. And one of the questions, and I'm a little bit out of order, and I apologize to the people on the webinar, but I think it flows well from that. Um, what is one thing, or top three or five, 
you would want city governments to do to support parks and trails? How can they facilitate the construction of new parks and trails? So what can city government, if you had a wish list from city government, I'm, that's you work with them all. So she's got both I got hands. <laughs> I, I work with them all. I think the number one thing is that they have to look at new ways of thinking about car travel because we have put the car first before people for so long and how fast you can drive your car somewhere, one person in one car. And that is an issue of equity and it's an issue of backward thinking. It's an issue around transportation and who transportation engineers represent, which is the automakers. It seems to me, this, I'm, not, yeah, I'm not dissing anybody, but, no, so uh, it's all guess. about cars. <laughs> is anybody a transportation expert? I'm sorry. Well, but it has got to include <laughs> pedestrians. Not the ARC. Yeah. Other than ARC, <laughs> no. I know. Someone's about to like <laughs> tackle me. I can feel it. Um, You're going down, Mike. <laughs> yeah. So I think if you put people first, if you look at all the kids that are out on bicycles right now during COVID, when we come back to COVID, when they're on neighborhood streets, and they're not very safe at all when there's no sidewalks for kids to ride bikes on. They need a way to connect to other friends in the neighborhood to be able to get to school so every parent doesn't have to drive their kids somewhere because the bus has taken an hour and a half. I just think we have to back away from cars and put people first. Yeah. Okay. I, I jump in. I think operation maintenance is a huge thing. And it's just a fundamental government responsibility. And I, I say that as a city commissioner, so I, I can wear my hat here too. And so I do think Decatur as well. You pick up the trash, you take care of the parks, you make sure people have a good experience. Right. Yeah. And the funding for maintenance. Yeah. I'll, I'll just also add that I think that looking at public and private investments as part of a concurrent strategy is another thing that's sometimes lacking. We oftentimes look at the philanthropic sector as the group to cover a public need. And I think we should be looking at the operations and maintenance needs as something that needs to be provided by local governments. And then looking at ways of working in partnership with philanthropy to take something that would be good otherwise and making it great. And that's where you're actually working where those philanthropic dollars go beyond what would be appropriate in some cases in terms of those uh, you know, do I want my tax dollars going for the bells and whistles? Well, that's a great place for philanthropy, but I think sometimes we try to look at um, philanthropy as the solution to raising taxes and looking at public funding sources. And I don't think that that uh, realistically uh, sets us up for success. So I think if we can look at those as two sides of the same coin, then we uh, develop a sustainable approach moving forward that leverages, I think, even more philanthropic dollars if there's a mm -hmm. sense that there's equal commitment on the public sector side of things. Yeah, good point. Just, just real quick, I'll add this, since I did do 10 years with uh, a government, formerly in another life, not too long ago, I will add this, that when we adopt these amazing plans like comprehensive transportation plans and zoning plans and parks master plans and these uh, overlay district uh, plans that we work very hard on, these LCI initiatives, that after you adopt them, of uh, friends in government, stick to them. Go back and support the departments in the lifting of the projects we have told the public we are going to do. Do mm. not change your mind that fast before mm -hmm. we deliver the good. Because when we're able to deliver the good consistently, those of us on this phone, because we're not politicians, um, we make the story better. The cream rises faster. I promise you it does and it will. And so um, for our leadership that's in now, we, we have an amazing mayor in Atlanta. I have an amazing CEO in DeKalb. I have a new mayor in Stonecrest, a new mayor in Lithonia. Uh, Henry and Rockdale leadership are old professionals. Stick to the guiding documents that the public has approved and for the projects that we have put into the pipeline and allow those to be completed and support those departments. Coming from a former employee, Thank you. Preach. We do have one politician on this call. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's. A, I think this is a great, uh, great moment to transition. And um, I think for everybody on the webinar, I'd like to thank you all for taking your time 
uh, to, to be with us today. I think this has been uh, just maybe my favorite webinar that I've been on. Um, some of the things, I'll go back and listen to the recording. I'm gonna steal some of the things I heard today. You got your hat back on, you're ready to roll. Yeah. And so um, I, will, I will get into trouble if I don't bring up the, the, uh, the next big event the ARC is having is the state of the region breakfast it's all virtual this year uh so i'll be there have, yes if you haven't I'm signed coming. up for state of the region um i think you're going to find the staff that work on that have uh have really done an amazing job putting it together a, the best virtual program we possibly can for our most attended events so please please sign up for the state of the region uh breakfast and Again, I'm going to be taking a lot of notes after this one. Again, it's just been amazing. Thank you so much to everyone um, for your time and your commitment to this. Um, the thing I'd say, Michael, uh, you talked about not having to do, not being just parks planners anymore, but I think one of the things that I've heard from all of you is that you're truly advocates. And advocating for parks is a big part of it. Uh, for all of us going forward and, and making them a priority. And that's that's something that I'm committed to. And I know the ARC staff yeah. is absolutely committed to. So with that, happy Thursday. I hope you get your power back. I'm going to go find out if mine is on yet. I don't think it is. So enjoy your day. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.